After a summer of turmoil, what's the state of global financial stability? What are the main challenges for advanced and emerging economies? These are the main topics of the Fall 2015 Global Financial Stability Report. To discuss the report, he is Jose Vinhaus, Financial Counselor and Director of the IMF's Monetary and Capital Markets. Welcome, Jose. Thank you. So let's take it from the previous report where we said that risks were rotating from advanced to emerging economies. What's the situation now? Regarding global financial stability, we are not yet in a, in a comfortable zone. Uh, it is not yet assured and in fact uh, while uh, advanced economies uh, are doing a little bit better, uh, emerging market risks remain elevated as far as financial stability is concerned. Something which is also very important is that some of these risks in emerging markets are becoming more tangible and some are already starting to materialize. And this is something which is very important given the very critical role that emerging markets play in the global economy. And as we saw this summer with the uh, turmoil which uh, originated uh, in China, this had important uh, global impacts, spillovers, which were more intense than anticipated both in emerging economies and also in advanced, uh, in advanced economies. With these risks materializing, as you said, and we saw the impact of this during the summer, what are the main challenges now for both advanced and emerging economies? Regarding the um, enhancement of global financial stability, there are three challenges. One is for advanced economies to deal with the remaining legacies of the crisis. The second, for emerging markets to address some of the vulnerabilities that they have accumulated in the last few years. And third, to make sure that market liquidity is resilient. Now, these three policy challenges surround a baseline for global financial stability which is not yet satisfactory. And depending on how policymakers handle these different challenges, we may end up in different places. We may end up in a good scenario where there is a normalization of monitoring financial conditions and the world goes to a higher growth and strong financial stability situation, or we may slip because of shocks or policy, policy missteps or policy inaction in a downside scenario, which is characterized by market turmoil with lower growth and uh, problems for financial stability. And the difference between the upside and the downside scenario is equivalent to something like 3% of global output of the next two years. So that's an important difference. So what needs to be done to avoid this downside scenario? Let's start with advanced economies. Okay. Advanced economies need to uh, address the uh, legacies uh, from the crisis. And that means, for example, that the United States needs, needs to address the legacy of uh, very low interest rates. And it is now going to embark on an unprecedented process of monetary normalization where the big, big challenge is to get the timing right of the policy decisions, to communicate it in a way which is sufficiently transparent to markets and the public, and also to take into account in the decision-making process appropriately the spillovers and spillbacks uh, surrounding these monetary policy decisions. Europe also has an important uh, task ahead. It has to address the legacies of um, damaged balance sheets which remain in banks and which remain in corporates. In the banking sector, still has to address the non-performing loans which remain after having successfully increased the capitalization of the banking systems in Europe. And at the same time, it needs to deal with the private uh, corporate debt overhang by proceeding to restructure or renegotiate the debts of those companies which are viable but which have too much debt. And in addition, Europe needs to strengthen euro area financial and fiscal architecture. Advanced economies have a very heavy agenda ahead of them. And how about emerging markets? What do they have to do? Emerging markets have also important things to do. For example, many of these economies uh, have had very rapid uh, processes of, of credit creation, and they are now in the late stages of the financial cycle where non-performing loans are expected to increase in the future. At the same time, um, emerging market corporates have increased very much the leverage, both in domestic and international markets, 
a lot of this leverage has been in foreign currency. And this has happened at a time where the balance sheets have become weaker. So all of this makes emerging markets be in a position where they're more exposed to an eventual uh, tightening of global financial conditions, to depreciation of their currencies, and also uh, in an environment where the growth prospects is going to be lower and where commodity prices are going to be low for quite some time. So all of these are challenges to emerging markets which may lead to adverse feedback loops developing between corporates, banks and sovereigns and therefore it's key that they put in place prudential policies to enhance the resilience of the corporates and the banks. To wrap up, what's the difference between doing the right thing and not doing the right thing? It's very significant. In fact, um, the difference between the upside and the downside scenarios that will come from doing or not the right monetary and financial policies amounts to close to 3% of global GDP between now and the end of 2017. This is important and this means that everybody must play its part because we are all in this together, advanced economies and emerging markets. Thank you very much, Jose. You're welcome.